Hey everyone, what's up? It is George Kroos with another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I actually have Deidre Raymer on my podcast today and I actually have known her for a while but this is the first time I've actually learned how to say her last name because it's pronounced a different way with a lot of the kids that I work with because it's a very common name uh, in uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan. But just to tell you a little bit about Deidre before we get on, Deidre is probably one of the best leaders I know in education. She does incredible things. Uh, she has an incredible vision, but she makes things happen. And everything that is happening in her, her district that's just outside of Milwaukee is really focused on building relationships and connecting with kids, but it's really a how to empower, how empower students and really how she empowers her teachers, her administrators to do really incredible things. And so Every time I have a conversation with Deidre and I see the things that are happening in the district, I am absolutely blown away. And she will never say this to you. Like she will never brag about anything that's going on in the district. So that's why I'm doing this because I'll tell you, if you can see what's happening in West Allis and see the things that they're doing and how they've actually prepared um, their kids in a way where they've had a really smooth transition to what is going on uh, with all the coronavirus stuff, with moving online, and I'm not saying probably Deidre will tell you not everything has been totally smooth, but it's a lot smoother than many places because they have been working toward really empowering kids, really giving them opportunities to uh, learn in meaningful ways. So it's just been really interesting to watch. And I, I wanted to have Deidre on here because I wanted just to talk about some of the things that are happening in your district right now, some of the things they were doing before all this happened, what they're doing now and what they're going to kind of do after. So Deidre, thank you so much for joining us. And if you could just share kind of who you are and what you do. I, I think everyone would be really interested in that. Awesome. Um, well, thanks so much for having me on and thank you for the kind words. It's um, well deserved. Or, thank you. Um, we get the privilege to work on behalf of kids every day and do some amazing things. And that's work that we're doing right now that makes me really proud. And um, we have staff and teams that work really, really hard to make that happen that I have the privilege every day to get to support. So I'm pretty fortunate. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, my title is the Director of Leadership and Learning. So we are um, the first neighboring school district to Milwaukee in Wisconsin, like George said. We have about 8,000 kids. Um, we have 18 schools. So I have 11 elementary schools, three intermediate schools, two comprehensive high schools, a project-based learning high school, and then a charter school for school-age parents um, that are all part of the programs that I oversee. Um, and my role is pretty unique when it comes to school districts. So we hit a financial crisis a few years ago. Um, if you Google us, you can read all about that unfortunate time in our world. Um, but we hit this financial crisis and we tried really hard to solve the financial crisis by not taking anything out of classrooms that we could avoid. So what we did was we eliminated a ton of the positions in our district office and consolidated as many of the positions as we could to try to save the dollars there and not take things away from classrooms and from kids and from things that kids need every day. So out of that came the role that I'm in now. So I oversee all of curriculum and instruction, all of student services and special ed. I do our principal coaching. Um, I do all of our school improvement planning. I do all of our like grant, I do a bunch of our grant work or federal grants and things like that. And then I oversee um, the parts of the teacher supervision and evaluation process in my first year. So I was half of HR as well in my first year of doing this role um, at a time when we were trying to work through a lot of really challenging things like a huge financial mess and trying to figure out what does teaching and learning look like. And we had had a mass exodus of teachers in our school district. And so we had the opportunity to say, okay, well, out of a crisis comes opportunity. So what are we going to make of it? And so that's where the role that I serve in now was born from. Um, I can very, very proudly say we have righted our financial ship and we are right back to where we need to be about three and a half years later, which is a pretty remarkable turnaround for a school district um, that doesn't have endless sources of income to be able to shift some things around. Um, and in that, we've had then the chance to say, do we go back to my role being four or five different kind of people doing similar tasks? and We've been pretty clear to say no, because the shift of practice that that's allowed, the role being merged, means we're making all of the decisions on behalf of the kids, on behalf of the leaders, on behalf of the teachers from one office. And I have this unbelievably amazing team that does that work with me. We're a small team compared to most district offices, but I have this very cool, hardworking 
thinking outside the box, inside the box, and getting rid of the box when we need to mm -hmm. kind of team that we do that work with every day. And it's really streamlined some things so that we can, when we're pushing on our bus, we're all doing it from the back versus two of us on the side and one at the back thinking we're going to get anything to move. That, that whole, that whole idea, the, you know, like obviously Katie Novak and I wrote the book innovate inside the box. And the reality of it is, is the, there is a box presented to your district, which sucked, which was, you know, not really good. And not only did you actually deal with those constraints, deal with those things, but you thought differently about the box and then walked out of it doing really amazing things for kids. And like that, that to me is just, just really mind blowing. Cause I think a lot of times like that would be such an easy thing to say, look, we don't have this, we don't have this and just kind of, you know, pack it in and, you know, like there's a difference between showing up every single day and showing up and doing incredible things. Cause it would be easy just to kind of show up and be there and, you know, try to get out of there as soon as possible, as opposed to saying, okay, like what are some opportunities through this, you know, the, this issue that we're dealing with and actually to make things better for kids. And one of the things I've really noticed about your district and I, I think is interesting is there is this balance. I know that there's, there's like superintendents, leaders that are really loved and they're really personable and great and people feel like awesome all the time, but it doesn't mean they're necessarily actually moving forward and growing, right? Like it's, it's more, um, uh, my friend AJ Giuliani will say like the mayor, like the, the mayor, right? Like they show up and everyone likes that person. And like, I feel that vibe when I, when I actually work with your school district, I feel like a really excited, you know, staff that's really eager. I'm sure. And obviously like someone doesn't like you, someone doesn't like your super, I guarantee, right? Like sure. it's impossible, <laughs> but that on, but the reason I bring this up is because it is also while you are pushing people to get better. Right. And so how do you kind of like figure that out? Like, how do you get that space where, you know, people feel really appreciated and valued, but they're also being challenged and pushed and they're growing, right? Like they're like, how, how do you kind of go about that in, in the process of the work that you're doing? Um, yeah, I mean, that is the challenge and I'm not one to shy away from a hard conversation ever. Mm -hmm. Um, if it's right for kids, then I'm happy to push at any given time. But if you push people too hard and too fast, you alienate them and you don't have them coming along with what you're doing. And I think when we, our superintendent is in his fifth year now, I think fifth year. Um, and when he came in, one of the things that was really important is to get a strategic plan around what is it we're trying to do here? because we were doing a whole lot of things. I just don't know that they were all aligned around all the right things. And so we made a strategic plan. And one of the things that was really important was to say, what's something we're holding in common at all 18 of these schools on behalf of somewhere between eight and at the time we started the strategic plan about 9,000 kids, we're closer to eight now. Um, but what are we doing that we're gonna hold in common at all of those sites? And then what's a site-based decision and what's a teacher's-based decision? Right. And so that grounding around, hey, this is what we're holding in common. So that's where you know I'm gonna push really, really hard because that's something we've agreed that we are all as a system holding in common. This is a site-based decision. So I might be giving you feedback on that and saying, hey, here's some things I'm hearing that you're saying, or here's some things I'm doing. I'm curious about this. I wonder what this would do. What if you thought about it this way? And the same with a classroom-based decision. And so I think that helps empower people to say, okay, I do get to make a lot of the decisions on my own. And yet I have this backing and support. And some of that comes from finding those bright spots and figuring out how do you highlight the hack out of somebody who has tried something new, whether it worked or not, right. and say, hey, isn't this awesome? So-and-so tried something new and look what happened for the learner. Let's, let me tell you a story about what a learner in that classroom was able to articulate to me when I went in there and started asking some questions about what they were doing and why. And I try to celebrate those bright spots from the lens of kids, right? So what are kids able to do in that room that we all wish all of our learner could do, learners could do? What are those kids able to articulate about what they own about the learning at five and six years old that my high school teachers are still struggling to get kids to own and articulate about the learning? And so... I think that's been a big part of the work for us is to say, 
couple of things like I've got you right. Like try mm -hmm. something and what, well, what are you going to do if it doesn't work? I'm going to help you understand why it didn't work and figure out some part of it worked. There's no, I've never tried anything where no part of it worked. So something about that worked and we're going to figure out what did work about that. And then we're going to iterate and try again. And we've been really clear in our messaging around do new things, try new things, like be a part of growing into the next version of what we need for kids all the time. And we're going to celebrate that when it's super successful. And we're going to celebrate it when you tried something that didn't work because it'll help us do better the next time. I think the, like one of the things I'm, when I'm hearing and listening to you, you're pushing people, but it's, they're also like a part of the conversation of where the push is going, right? It's not like, Hey, we're going to push you, but like based on what we think is right, what doesn't matter what your opinion is, right? Like you're really getting them in on the process and giving them ownership over it's total like a hundred percent ownership over some, well, I shouldn't say a hundred because it's not a reality, but you know, at least like 98%, right. Where they're giving the direction and you're just there to support as opposed to like, you need to do these things. But the, the reason I kind of pulled that out and I think is really important is that you're not just doing that with your staff. You also are really empowering student voice through this. And uh, I, I wrote about this uh, the, when I was with um, West Alice in August. Uh, Deidre actually had brought in some students to start the day off to share some conversations. And what I loved about it was these were actually not kids that were like just accelerating through like a traditional, for lack of a better term, program. They had actually struggled and they were brought into the conversation with the administrators to talk about like what were some of the issues, why were some of the things that were happening in schools not working. And I think it's really easy when we bring students to bring our students who are like the high academic achievers and I, I make sure that we distinguish the difference between academically gifted and smart because those aren't always the same things because the kids who actually were there that day were very intelligent, but school wasn't working for them. Okay. And I thought that was like really interesting. And so kind of like what, what's the process of like, why were you doing that? Like, why did you choose the students that you chose that day? And, and, like, why is it so important to like West Alice to really bring in students? Cause it's like, that's not the only time. Like, it's not just like a one-time thing. You're bringing right. students in all the time for professional learning. Yeah. Um, so we started bringing kids in all the time for professional learning this year. So that was yeah. kind of our first foray into it that time you were with us in August. And um, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I went to, I go to graduation at what was our alternative high school. So this is kids who went through our traditional system, went to our comprehensive high schools, ended up so ridiculously credit deficient that then we would send them to this magical place where we had people who were all at-risk licensed teachers are all still at-risk licensed teachers and they do a lot of things with alt ed and things like that. But they would care for these kids in a way that was so intense and personal. And then they would help them figure out a life plan. But our system for doing that meant that we had kids who failed a number of times in our own system. And you had to fail enough times to get into this environment where somebody did that work with you. And I'm sitting there at graduation last June, and I'm listening to this speech about what this experience at Dackey um, High School, which is the name of the high school, what this experience at Dackey did for the valedictorian right? Who's really just a student elected person. It's not necessarily the person with the highest grades, but so what the experience there did for that learner and then what her other experiences had been up until that point. And I sat there thinking, everybody needs to hear from this kid. The kid is saying like, here's a bunch of places where you guys got it right. Here is a way that school did not meet my needs in any way, shape or form. And then here is the magic and wonderful thing that happened to me that then is making me ready to go off to college. She was headed to college. She's in college now, um, right? Like headed to go out into the world and do whatever it was she wanted to do. College was her choice, right? So that's what we facilitated and helped her get scholarships and do all of those kinds of things. But as I sat there listening to her, I thought that's the kid that needs to talk to all of us, right? She was a third grader in one of our classrooms at one point. And somewhere along the way, life happened to her and school happened to her in a way that broke. And so then we went back and fixed it, which is amazing. But 
why do we have a system where there's opportunity for something to get broken? And then we have a system where we designed it so that we could go back and fix it. Like it started to not make any sense to me. So the panel of learners that we had in, in August to kick off our leadership series. So leadership for us, our principals, assistant principals, instructional coaches, deans of students, and our district office team. Um, were the, a bunch of kids from that school. So I asked the principal, I want the valedictorian there to tell her story. And then I want to hear from four or five other kids that day. And so he chose students to represent kind of what they do. Again, that aren't necessarily kids that normally would be picked for something. They were terrified to talk to a room of adults when we got there. Um, I had to do a lot of, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. And promise them they didn't have to use a microphone. That was kind of the deal. Um, and they did. They just, all I said is, I want you to tell your story because it's your story. And it's really what happened to you within our system. And they pointed out a lot of things we do really, really well. And then they gave us some things to work on. And the things that they gave us to work on, some of those were really hard to hear really, really hard to hear. The disconnect they felt in some of our schools, especially as they got older. Um, and then from there, we then had another pan learner panel at our next um, leadership meeting, so principals and instructional coaches. And that is from a flexible learning community that we have in one of our middle schools that gave a, went to a national conference and presented on relationships with our content. They have 125 kids in a wide open room, and it is one of the most magically beautiful classrooms I've ever been in. It's so unbelievably learner empowered and just beautiful the way they work with kids and the way they build relationships. So we had a panel of those kids come in and talk about what is their learning experience like that we're getting right all the time. And then we had several other panels come in and talk to leadership. We had panels come in and talk to our high school staff at our professional development day. Um, and then we kicked off our student businesses at our last one. But the common message that all of those panels, even the kids that we're getting it right for and the kids that you know we had struggles with along the way, basically told us two things. They wanna know that teachers care about them and that they have a relationship with someone and they don't wanna be bored at school. Like it's the same message regardless of who I ask. They, they actually, I remember, like I've shared the story several times uh, on that day. I remember one of the students distinctly saying um, that she had suffered depression for years and she, I can't remember if she outright said it, but she did hint at suicidal thoughts. And she said that basically the one thing that kept her alive every single day was a teacher who greeted her and addressed her by name every single day that actually never taught her a class ever in her entire career. And she said about like, and that's this is one of the focuses I've always had is that like every one of us, when we look at our schools, every kid in that school, whether we teach them or not, is our kid. And we need to really focus on like, how do we support, like when you pass a kid in the hallway, really lose an opportunity. Um, like if we don't say hi or just acknowledge them in some way to not only make that kid's day, but you know, in that case, help that kid's life, right? Like it was just really amazing. And one of the reasons I wanted to really uh, connect with Deidre is one of the things that I'm really impressed with is is the kind of just laser focus on ensuring that every kid in your school district has an has an opportunity to be successful in a way that's meaningful to them, and really talking about creating those opportunities at the highest levels. And Deidre, I know that you had shared like your your kids are not in school right now, right? They're yeah. they're doing yeah. online learning, and you actually. I'm just, you correct me if I'm wrong here. Not only you have some kids who do not have access to technology, some kids who don't have access to uh, Wi Fi, mm -hmm. and your schools, what you actually did is you provided that. Is that correct? Yeah. So like, tell yeah. me, tell so, me what that process, like, like, how did you ensure that kids are getting, because um, I you know a lot of districts are saying, well, some kids don't have it, so nobody should be doing this. Yeah. So if for saying, us, hey, we, get we kids, thought it was really really important at this time to make sure that we are creating as much equitable access to everything as humanly possible. And so that meant that we had to have a plan. We serve a population of kids um, that about 56% of our kids qualify for free and reduced lunch, which means they're from families of economic disadvantage. And so the access to devices they have or may not have at home um, is varied all over the place. And so it was really important to us. We had about, you know, 24 hour turnaround to say, okay, hey, suddenly we're gonna be this new online institution and what are we gonna do for our kids to make sure that they have 
as much access as we can. And how are we going to get them their meals? And how are we going to still get, we have licensed therapists that work in every single one of our schools that see kids um, for mental health therapy uh, weekly through insurance, or they help the family to get insurance if they don't have it. So how do we maintain kids access to mental health care? And how do we, so we had this laundry list of things that we wanted to be sure our kids had access to when the world is kind of turning upside down and everything looks different. Um, and so we started at the school level and parents could just request if they needed a device to be borrowed from school to go home. Um, we're one-to-one -one at our elementary schools, but we keep the devices at school. So we just issued those and sent them home. We bought hotspots and sent hotspots into families that couldn't get our local um, internet providers providing free service right now, but it was harder for some of our families to get to and all of those kinds of things. So we have hotspots. We purchased some Go phones because we have families without a phone right now. Um, and we want to be able to call that learner every day. We want to connect with them somehow online every day to say, hey, are you okay? Is there something that you need? And then we put up stations for free breakfast and lunch all over the place, which a lot of people do. But starting on Monday, we're also going to make those more mobile. Um, we're in a stay-at-home order at um, in Wisconsin right now through April 24th. So the idea is that you're trying to stay at home as much as humanly possible. So we're going to start sending a food truck into the communities to hand out breakfast and lunch at places that are more accessible and hopefully we'll draw fewer crowds into locations and then make sure that our families have what they need. And then our counselors are still following up with every family. So if we don't hear from a student online, either in a daily Zoom call or a Google chat or because they've told us what kind of progress they're making on a project that they're doing at home online or through some kind of daily communication. Um, then we have all of our educational assistants and our counselors and our APs and our secretaries making phone calls. And um, we were doing home visits to connect with all the kids as well and keep that access to bodies. Like how do we make sure that kids are okay during this time? And then also keep some of the stability and consistency of learning that kids are gonna need. And some kids are ready for that right now and some kids were struggling with that and it's been a lot and a lot of workload so we're trying to balance that. So we did a lot of that all in about 48 hours. And then we got the, okay, now no groups of larger than 10. Okay, so now, Nobody can come into the building to pick up the devices. So we had um, a series of drive up stations at every single school and everybody gloved up and administrators would run up and down a line of cars and take names and get forms signed and then run back out with a device and hand it through the window and off mm. the parent went and off they, off they went. So we have parents right now still requesting devices. So we have one central location where we put devices, you know, hotspots and, um, access to computers because some of our families who thought they didn't need one at the start of this are realizing a couple weeks in like whoa this is harder than i thought to not have two devices one for me and one for my child and mm -hmm. so they're still picking them up today okay so i just want to point out a couple of things that i think are really important to first of all there's a there's there's a lot of high poverty areas in your district correct mm -hmm. yep okay so if you're listening to Deidre through this conversation, first of all, she tell, she's sharing the story about how her district had serious financial restrictions. And I'm sure that you, I, I don't think your district hit the lottery since then, right? Like, no. so, so you have this, um, you have lots of students who need, but you're still finding a way to provide this. And I think that's a really important thing is that we're, I think it's, I don't think you, and you correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think you came into a bunch of money, but I think you have a certain allocation of money. You said, okay, we have to really rethink how we're doing some things and maybe why are we still spending X amount on this when it'd be better suited for this, right? Like if you, so for example, and I was just thinking about this yesterday, if your school district goes to one to one, your paper budget should actually go down significantly, right? Like little things like that start to add up over time. And I think there's ways and, and what you're proving is that you can actually, I'm not saying like, I'm not saying schools shouldn't get less money because that's not what I'm, I, a lot of people pick that up from, from these conversations, but you're saying like, this is what we have, but we got to figure out how to help these kids. And, right. and like, like a lot of people say, well, oh, like you can't say, well, you're a private school. You can't say like you're flush with money, but you still are doing things that a lot of schools are, are, I don't want to say that they're not able to do, but aren't they're trying to figure out right and yeah, i think I mean, they a, can yeah any kind of budget is a priority 
right? So it's right. like where your priorities are or where your where you spend your dollars. And you're right, we have not won the lottery. We did not, we do not suddenly have this influx of cash that we don't know what to do with anymore. And so you're probably very, and I bet you your district is sensitive to spending money too. Oh, big time. Yeah, big right. time. When you go through a financial crisis and um, you go through that and your taxpayers start to not trust necessarily like how you spend your money or what you do with it, you're really sensitive to how you spend the money. And you spend a lot of time making sure people understand like that everything we spend our money on is based on a needs based, you know, a, a decision that based on need that whether right. it's the teachers are saying, Hey, what's we're struggling with is this. And here's why, or, Hey, what we really need if we want to give access to all kids is this, or, Hey, I'm trying to do these new things, but without these devices or without this access to podcasting equipment or without this access to this, I'm going to struggle. And so it is a matter, any budget is a matter of priorities. And at the same time, we want to be able to compensate our teachers more than we can right now and do all of those things. So right. those are priorities for us as well. Um, the priorities of access for kids for tools that they can use to create and do amazing things in the classroom have helped us in this particular situation because our kids are used to using them. So when we sent them home, in a lot of cases, it was a smoother transition for some of our families and some of our kids, for a, mm -hmm. a good majority of our kids, than it might have been in a lot of places. Uh, so Deidre, you, you, we talked about like things that you were doing before all this. We're talking about things you're doing now. What do you think is going to change? Like, what do you think is going to change for the better after yeah, this? Like when so, your kids go back? Um, well, again, weathering a financial crisis Mm -hmm. teaches you a ton about your priorities, right? And so, and weathering a crisis like that and turning it into an opportunity to do something really amazing in our schools and have it be the moment at which we say, hey, let's throw our hands up in the air and say, why don't we start trying to do this? Or why don't we start trying to do this? Um, is kind of now the way we operate. We spend a lot of time saying, why are we doing that? And if we don't have a really good reason for why we've structured something a particular way or why we do something a particular way, we start to say, well, maybe you shouldn't do it that way anymore. And right. we figure it out from there. And so we're spending some time right now. I had a principal meeting yesterday to say, okay, what are you capturing right now as teachers are learning how to do new things? I, I have obviously, hundred, we have several hundred teachers, we have over um, about 700 staff that I were in my area. Um, and most of them had never used Zoom before a week right. and a half ago, right? So now they are. And now kids are reporting back cool things. And some of our teachers that wanted to read a novel with all of the kids are saying, oh, I can't actually sit in a room and read a novel with kids right now and, and do a discussion on that. So what could I give them to do that was more project-based to demonstrate that they understood how the novel connects to our current world or how the novel connects to what we're doing? So my job is now to start to say, how are we capturing some of that to make sure that when we get back to whatever our new normal is, mm -hmm. after all of this is over, that teachers start to realize that some of what they did during this time that was out of their comfort zone was better for kids. And so what parts of it were? Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, you know, we're pushing hard on making sure that this idea that you could just take what you did at school and stick it in people's houses, that, that's not a thing. Like you can't, I can't just make a school in my house all of a sudden. It runs very differently. But the learning that you can do in your home actually is a lot like the learning you could do in a physical school building if you're focused around really essential skills and how do you build those through cool and interesting things and things that kids might create. We're um, working on right now trying to start a district-wide project. And so we had a teacher launch um, the Great Epic Tomato Challenge a couple of weeks ago where he put out some videos saying, hey, what if we all built like grew tomato plants in our houses while we're all locked in our houses and then use those to build community gardens in our area when this was all said and done. Um, so we have people actually nationally now making tomato plants in their backyard. Um, some people in Tennessee and some people in California doing it. We have people all over our school district growing tomato plants in their house. And it was a mm. unifying thing that we could all do together. We have some families who are struggling to put one meal on the table who are not growing tomato plants in their backyard right now. Like right. that's not a realistic possibility for them. So our next step was to say, ooh, that's a cool idea as to how we unify people around what are kids doing at home right now that we need to capture. So we're working on a personal passions project going into the weeks after spring break. So what would it look like if all of our kids told us and shared with us in some kind of learning moment 
what are they working on now? Because I have learners right now who are perfecting something. They are learning how to cook. I was watching, I'm following a you know, bunch of our families online who are saying, hey, I'm gonna teach my six-year-old how to cook because we're stuck in the house all day together. So I'm gonna teach them how to cook. So I thought, oh, that kid's learning how to cook. That's interesting, okay? Now I've got other kids learning the guitar. I've got kids mastering some kind of video game right now at some super high level. Um, we have kids building skateboards in their backyard. So we have kids that are spending some of their time learning a new skill or iterating a skill that they already had into something that they can perfect and do so much better. How are we gonna capture that as well? Like what did they do when they weren't with us to carry over into school and make that part of the learning? And how do we bring those personal passions back into our schools when this thing is all said and done? So those are all things that we're working on now. How does the principal capture some of what he's seeing to celebrate those bright spots? Mm -hmm. They share a lot of those with myself and our superintendent and the two of us spend a lot of time reaching out to those staff and saying, hey, I can't believe you tried that. That's awesome. Great job. Can't wait to see what comes of it next. So that's what we're trying to do right now. How do you capture the, the things that were easier for people in this shift, you know, when something happens mm -hmm. to create that opportunity to share those more with people when we get back? And then how do the people who are making a new shift of their practice right now, how do we capture that and remind them of that and celebrate that and keep them going when we get back in our, you know, brick and mortar buildings? It kind of sounds like um, the passion projects. It kind of sounds uh, like the identity day mm -hmm. thing that we used to do in our schools. Yeah. Um, we used to have students share their passion. We'd have a day about it, but it sounds like a virtual version, which is really, really cool. And I think, I think not only does it give kids some opportunity to really be empowered in their learning, but it helps build relationships when they come back, right? Like if you have a kid who I'm teaching who's playing guitar, I'm playing guitar at the same time. We have an instant connection when we walk back in those buildings. I think that's amazingly powerful. And so uh, we're just about done here, Deidre. And I just, uh, I've been asking everyone this, like what is your best advice for people right now for what's going on? Like what, what would you like, what's one thing you'd share with them to do right now? Um, I would say one thing that I would share, I'm using the word grace quite a bit with our teachers and our families and our principals, like give each other grace. There are days when, you know, becoming an online instructor in my home, just like everybody else was not super smooth transition for us. Um, we are trying to do zoom calls for work and my boys are supposed to be on Zoom calls at home. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've been communicating back and forth with our families a lot. And I communicate back and forth with my teachers, the teachers that my boys have at school all the time to say, hey, here's where we got going today. And here's what we're going to be doing today. And here's what we're going to be working on. So that's the one big piece of advice I would tell people is use this time to try something new that makes some sense within where people are in their lives and give each other grace. Like if kids can't get something done right now, this is not the time to be saying, oh, now we're going to grade them differently or now we're <laughs> going to do something like that. No, right. this is the time to say, what could you do with this time and what could you try? And as a teacher, what could I learn and grow? Right. And then we're telling our principals, like give the teachers a moment to pause and take a deep breath if they need it. Give the kids and the families a moment to pause and take a deep breath and just show each other some grace, like try to be empathetic to each other and take a deep breath and know that this is an opportunity for us to really think differently about our work and the meaning of our work. And yet the value of our work is still there. And the value of what we do every day in schools is still going to be there when we get back into them. Absolutely. I love, I love that concept of grace. Cause I think we all need that, right? Like I, you know, I've, I've been actually doing really, really well um, with all of this stuff, except for yesterday sucked. And I don't know, you know, it was just an off day for me and, you know, I, I think even, even, you know, someone might be 90% awesome, but they're going to have those 10% days and it could be the exact opposite, right? They might only have 10% good. Um, so first of all, Deidre, thank you so much for your leadership, all that you do for education, just really inspiring. And I know that, um, I know that you won't take all the credit and you, you don't, because you actually have amazing people in your district. Every time I come mm -hmm. there, um, yeah. I'm just blown away by the conversations I have with your administrators, your teachers. This is just a group that's really eager to go, but I know that it's a lot because of not only your willingness to lead and really be empathetic to what people do, but your willingness to push them to, to be better. And I know that they trust you because they know that you got their back. So um, Deidre, where can people connect with you? 
Yeah. Um, so you can check out a ton of our stuff. Uh, we have a, obviously a district website, um, the West Dallas, West Milwaukee School District. So we're a joint community school district. Um, so if you Google us, you can follow us on our website. Um, I have a Twitter. So it's Deidre underscore Raymer um, is my Twitter handle. Um, so you can follow me on Twitter. I have a blog that you can follow. That That's awesome. Read. The blog Thanks. is awesome. Very Thank good. you. Yeah, I tell you, one of the things I'm adjusting to in this new world is how to find a time to write. Because usually mm -hmm. I do that kind of on my own. Is I that's like a thing I do. I go sit at a Starbucks or I go like right. sit in my office late at night after everyone else goes home when the kids are all at an activity, and that's when I write. And so I have not posted a new blog post since this whole change has happened because I'm trying to figure out my routine around that for myself right now. Um, but yeah, so I have a blog that you can follow. You can see it on the Twitter, and um, you can get all of my contact information on our um, district website as well. And feel free to follow along. There's a couple of videos on there around some of the work we've done at Dackey, some of the work we've done at Franklin Elementary. We'll have a new one up for some of the work we're doing at Walker Elementary because um, we're trying to capture those successes and share really cool things that we're doing and then use those to help each other grow. That's awesome. Well, I'm going to make sure that I list all the places they can connect uh, in the podcast uh, description as well as the YouTube description. But again, thank you and thank you for um, your friendship as well. I know you really pushed me to be better. Uh, please, everyone, if you if you don't connect with Deidre, make sure you do because you're going to learn a ton and just really inspiring and just really solution focused, which I'm so appreciative. So anyways, thanks for taking the time to listen. I hope you have a wonderful day. I appreciate your time. Take care. Thanks, George. Bye.